Dr. Freeman, uh, concerning your comments, uh, your non-controversial comments, uh, that there's no place for government in private medicine, uh, what are your views on the uh, regulatory powers of the FDA and the, the work that they're trying to do? <laughs> Well, uh, you have a great many heart specialists in this room, I think, or some. I think if you ask them, they will tell you that there are some excellent beta blockers which are available in Great Britain, in Canada, and in the rest of the world, which cannot be sold in this country because of FDA regulation. I have seen estimates from reputable physicians that the availability of those beta blockers would save roughly 10,000 lives a year. I believe the FDA as it has been operating, has, been, has, has done vastly more harm than good. I have no doubt that it has prevented some bad drugs from coming on the market. But in compensation for this, it has also prevented some very good drugs from coming on the market. It has made the cost of discovering and developing new drugs. It has increased it enormously. It has driven medical research out of this country and into other countries. So I think the FDA has been an unmitigated disaster over the past 20 years. Yes, sir. Dr. Friedman, I'm fascinated by your question or your statement that uh, licensure is something that has been a uh, uh, harmful effect, in, especially in the area of medicine. I think this probably comes as a bit of a shocker to uh, most of us. What do you um, uh, answer the uh, particular problem which relates to control, say, of quackery, of uh, inadequately trained individuals who are dealing with situations where vital decisions, of oh, course, sure. don't have the option for uh, the normal slow process of uh, people getting education, finding out. What uh, goes on during that particular period and how do you uh, worry all, about that? Sure, you should worry about that. Let me ask you first a very simple question. How many people do you know who pick their physician by opening the yellow pages, taking all the licensed physicians, taking a pin and sticking it in? Some, quite a number, I would suspect, might. <laughs> no, I, maybe. I don't know very many of those. My point is that having a license is no assurance of the ability to practice medicine. A man was licensed 30 years ago. He may be thoroughly incompetent now. So licensure is no assurance of quality. In the next place, we have lots of other assurances of quality. The fact that a man may offer himself as a physician doesn't mean that he can mis misrepresent his training. If I hang out a shingle saying I'm a graduate of the Harvard Medical School when I am not, well, then I ought to be sent to jail, and I should be sued for fraud and misrepresentation. So that there's nothing about the absence of licensure that makes it unnecessary for people to be able to demonstrate their capacities. And indeed, you would be more inclined under that kind of a system to look at what an individual's qualifications were. We don't require licensure for lots of skilled professions. We don't require licensure in most states for an architect. Yet very few pe architects are able to practice successfully without having good training. In the next place, the way in which you, we most of us, and this is why I linked this discussion to the Mayo Clinic, the way in which we most of us get assurance of quality about anything, it's not because we directly can judge. If I go buy a shirt at the store, I can't judge the quality of a shirt. If I buy an automobile, I can't judge the quality of the automobile. We get our assurance from the middleman, from the department store which stands in back of the shirt and which has a strong incentive to provide me with good shirts, from the dealer who wants to stay in business for a long time selling cars, has an incentive to provide a assurance of quality. People who come to Mayo's get their assurance of quality from the fact that Mayo Clinic has a e very strong incentive to choose able, well-trained physicians. In the absence of, the of licensure and the restriction on entries that accompanied it, you would have had a much greater development of hospital group practice of this kind, which would have provided a very much more effective technique of selection of quality of medicine. Next, the fact that you have had licensure has made it less, much more difficult over decades to eliminate low quality practice. As you know, only in recent years, you have had a spate of medical malpractice suits. One of the main reasons why you didn't have many more of them earlier was because the American Medical Association had a concerted uh, policy of making it extremely difficult. Physicians who were willing to testify in such cases found that they lost their hospital credentials. 
Now you come, why is licensure so essential? Because it is the key to the power of organized medicine. Without it, they would have no power to do harm. They would have lots of power to do good, but no power to do harm. Why is that the key? Because the key to the control of medicine starts with who is admitted to practice. Now, you cannot do it at the stage of licensure itself. If a man has gotten through medical school, if he is interned and so on, it's going to be very hard ultimately to deny him a, 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 a license. He's going to take the exam over and over again. If you want to control entry, and don't make any mistake about this, the evidence is overwhelming that there was a deliberate policy on the part of the Medical Association in the 1930s to keep down the number of physicians. That policy has changed in recent years for various reasons, but it was a policy for a long time. The most effective way to do it is to, at the, before people start going into medical schools. And licensure was a key to this because the licensure laws in almost every state, as a result of the, of the pressure of the organized medicine, require that nobody may be licensed who is not a graduate of an approved medical school. And by some strange accident, the list of approved schools in every state is identical with the list of schools approved by the Council on Medical Education and Hospitals of the American Medical Association. And I can go down the line, a long line, of this, and you will discover every time you look at this that the key element is licensure. Now, moreover, licensure is critical to preventing the unauthorized practice of medicine. You and I know, and many of us know, that there are many medical uh, practices which can perfectly well be carried out by people who do not have the full training, people who are uh, medical technicians. There has been some increasing use of them in recent years. But one of the main factors that has prevented a more effective use of medical technicians, a more effective use of the physicians, has been the definition of what is medical practice and what is unauthorized. You've started me on a subject on which I could go a long time, but perhaps I've said enough to suggest that it isn't quite as simple as it may seem at the outside. Now, the label of good housekeeping is not the same thing. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Friedman, you mentioned that 80% of the people in the country are covered by private uh, insurance plans. I'm curious as what your uh, proposal would be to cover those who presently are not uh, covered and uh, those who truly cannot afford at this point because they are below the so-called poverty level, they are not in organized labor, they are not a member of a of a large corporation which provides such a plan for its employees. I, I said before, I do not believe you ought to have any special program for medicine at all. Yes, I understand. I believe I have long been in favor of substituting for our present whole set of welfare arrangements a comprehensive negative income tax, uh -huh. which would provide to individuals below a level a sum of money which would assure that they would be able to maintain a particular level. There is no reason why part of that sum of money cannot be spent on the purchase of the same kind of medical insurance everybody else has. I have long been opposed, and I think you should be opposed, to giving special sums of money for people for housing, and another sum for food, and another sum for clothing, and another sum for medical care. We ought to give people, the problem of poverty is money. Right, exactly. And we ought to have a program <laughs> under which we assure a minimum level of, right. of income of spending, and then let people spend it the way they want. Absolutely. Good answer. Thank, Thank you. you.